The world is in the grip of several problems simultaneously attacking both the global economy and the financial markets. We have the European gas crisis. We have a Fed that has very overtly said it has to be hawkish in the near term. And therefore, the world financial markets have to negotiate both inflation and recession fears. Today in Global Dialogues, we have someone who is best placed to tell us how the global economy may negotiate these uh, contradictory forces. We have with us Jose Vinels. He is the chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, but a very interesting uh, set of credentials. Uh, uh, he was graduated from London School of Economics and then a doctoral degree from Harvard, a professor of economics at Stanford, and then served as a deputy governor of the Bank of Spain. and. Uh, I am a financial counselor at a very interesting period, 2009 to 2016, and now, of course, chairman at Standard Chartered Bank. Mr. Vinels, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Well, first up, since you are coming from Europe and from the UK, uh, if you can tell us uh, whether the gas crisis is going to, uh, you know, roil Europe for some time, do you see this, these as creating inflationary problems or recessionary problems? Well, thank you very much, and it's really, it's really great to be uh, again talking to you. Yes, Europe is in a, in a difficult situation as a result of the um, Russia-Ukraine crisis and the implications that have followed for uh, gas prices um, as a result of the reduction in the supply of Russian gas to, to, to Europe and to the United Kingdom as well. And this creates both things. It creates um, inflation because it increases energy prices and because energy is also an important input into so many other uh, products and services, this is something that leads to uh, a, a, a higher mm. uh, cost of living and a cost of living squeeze. So this is something which reduces the purchasing power of households. Uh, there are also higher production costs for firms, and this is something which reduces profitability and squeezes investment. So as a result, you have inflation and then you have a reduction in the pace of aggregate demand, and this is pushing Europe uh, also into uh, very lower growth and, and possibly into a recession in the European Union in the uh, in the later part of the year. Well, something uh, perhaps less severe but similar is playing out in the United States. Uh, what's your estimate uh, that uh, we should expect from the Fed? Should we expect uh, hikes to continue even beyond 4% Fed funds rate? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to say because it will depend very much on the pace of inflation reduction. What we know, especially uh, after uh, Jackson Hole and with the uh, very strong statements for, uh, from Chairman Jay Powell, is that the Fed is going to continue uh, in a very determined way to fight inflation. And the latest reading we have from, you know, uh, CPI in the United States is 8.5 percent. This is a slight moderation. So it seems like the policy of higher interest rates is uh, already contributing to some inflation moderation. But this is something that will continue. My expectation would be that between now and the end of the years uh, of the year, interest rates uh, by the Fed would be taken close to 4 percent. And contrary to what market expect, I don't think that they will go beyond 4% okay. or be cut next year. I think it's more likely that interest rates come close to 4% this year and then remain uh, in that sort of plateau for the rest of the year. And then if inflation keeps coming down, then we'll see. But I don't see a scenario where interest rates in the United States will be cut uh, early next year or even later in the year. That seemed to be the fine print both at Jackson Hole and in the previous FOMC minutes. But, uh, uh, you know, how do you expect uh, inflation to play out for the rest of the decade? There are people like El Arian and, uh, uh, you know, I think even Barry Eichengreen spoke to us on Global Dialogues. His expectation is that inflation may fall off from 85 but it may not come to the Fed's 2% uh, mark for a very long time. Uh, would, would you say that may be the scenario? Well, I think that this is certainly a possibility. My central scenario is that the Fed takes so 
uh, uh, you know, is so strongly determined to bring down inflation that they would do whatever is necessary to bring inflation to the average of 2%. And this is something that I think would be uh, closer than inflation remaining at 4%, because that would not be consistent with the Fed mandate. Now, I think the key question uh, would be if the Fed stick to its can, so bringing down inflation to 2%, um, what is going to be the implications for the real economy in the United States? And already what we're seeing in the United States is that the economy has had a technical recession in the second quarter. Yes. And I think that we're very likely to go to a real recession in terms of two quarters of negative growth in the last quarter of uh, uh, you know, this year and the first quarter of next year. So that doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to have for a full year, let's say next year, negative growth, but it's going to be close to that with parts of the year being in negative territory. So again, the implication is going to be some pain for the economic uh, growth in the United States, bringing it below zero for a couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, is going to be a price that the Fed is willing to take mm -hmm. in order to fulfill its mandate. Mm -hmm. And if the Fed were unable to do that, I would be really worried, because that would erode the credibility of the yes. Fed in fighting inflation, and the costs in terms of uh, the economy would be much higher over the longer term. So I think that central banks have this trade-off between shorter pain yeah. and then maintaining their credibility and avoiding costs over the medium term, which would be larger. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have seen the GFC and you were uh, at the helm of IMF uh, post the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. What's your sense in terms of the impact of a 4%, consistently high 4% Fed funds rate for probably the next eight quarters? Uh, can there be, you know, uh, nations or even large uh, corporate or financial entities that may default? Well, we have already seen um, some problems in some countries like, like Sri Lanka. And um, that certainly, uh, you know, that certainly already happened. Now, of course, when you have higher interest rates in the United States, which can accompany it with a, uh, by a strong dollar, this is something that puts pressure on emerging markets and developing economies, especially those who are highly indebted and those who are highly indebted in dollars. And there are some African countries which may be going through some pressures. But again, I think that we need to understand that the impact on uh, emerging markets and developing economies is going to depend very much on the strength of their domestic fundamentals. And if the economic fundamentals are solid, if uh, these are countries which have you know, significant foreign exchange reserves, which have reasonable policies, I think that markets are going to regard those countries in a much more favorable light, and therefore these countries are not going to be in trouble. While those countries which have, you know, inappropriate economic policies, where they are, you know, they have very little foreign exchange reserves, where they are not doing the right things in terms of fundamentals, and they have very significant mm -hmm. external debt, which may become unsustainable, markets will be uh, sort of. Uh, uh, moving against those uh, markets and there would be issues. You know, we've seen uh, the stock markets reflect that already. Uh, year to date or even month to date, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nifty, the Indian uh, uh, Nifty and Sensex, the stock indexes, have dramatically outperformed uh, American indexes, exactly. uh, Wall Street indexes. Uh, you know, we celebrated this even in 2008 for a period, or even in 2009, and we called it decoupling. Asia's macros are better. I mean, even Indonesia, to some extent, perhaps even Korea. The, uh, you know, the inflation is not that bad, and growth is not that much under pressure, at least in countries like India and Indonesia. You think Asia can definitely outperform over the next few quarters? I, I think so. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the West is suffering a lot more and Asia is in a much better position. Now, one should not underestimate the fact that the West is, is very much linked to Asia, and the West is a significant source of Asian, you know, of, 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 demand. Of, of demand for Asian yes. exports. But having said that, if you look at Asia, India is a case in point, is an economy which is doing extremely 
extremely well. The growth prospects for uh, India, both uh, this fiscal year, 23 and uh, 24 fiscal year, are, are very good with some moderation of growth next year. But still, you know, such a large emerging market with such high growth rates. This is something which is very hard to find in the world. And I think that this is something that bodes well for, for Asia. China also, they're having a, a, a you know a slowdown in growth this year. The expectation is that as they start reopening from, from COVID and with the policy support in place, they would be able to go to higher growth rates, uh, you know, uh, next year and so on. And we see also that the ASEAN economies are doing overall quite well. So I think that, I, I, you know, Asia is in a much better place and there is some asymmetry, I wouldn't speak of the coupling, but some asymmetry between the fortunes of Europe and the United States and the UK uh, compared to Asian countries at least for 22 and 23. Okay, so not decoupling, but uh, asymmetry in their macros. We need to scratch that point further. A quick break, and we are back with more questions to Dr. Hussein.